At 30 logical qubits, we expect to see a lot of the early applications that people have been ideating for the last several years translating to logical qubits, seeing that this is performing correctly and then porting it over in the fourth generation. The larger number of qubits, the 100 logical qubits, where you can just no longer have a classical computer predict exactly what the quantum computer will do. Quantum computing needs error-corrected logical qubits to exit the noisy or NISC era and bring real advantage to practical business and other use cases. A recent Harvard experiment created 48 logical qubits using a neutral atom platform, and the techniques will be implemented in Q-era production systems going forward. We might have 100 logical qubits by 2026. Learn what this vastly accelerated timeline means for the industry and find out how soon you can start using logical qubits in the cloud in this episode of the Post Quantum World. I'm your host, Konstantinos Kragianis. I lead quantum computing services at Prativity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. We have a repeat guest today, uh, the CEO of QR Computing, Alex Kiesling. Welcome back to the show. Hi, very happy to be back. Uh... Uh, yeah, and I mean, we, we've uh, crossed paths lots of times uh, since then at, at different shows and things, uh, but there is a really exciting reason uh, I have for inviting you back. So let's get right to the headline and not make anyone wait in suspense. Uh, 48 logical qubits. Uh, wow. <laughs> Tell us about this amazing development. Yeah, this, I, I, it's that is the headline, right? That's <clears throat> That's even in the... In the title of, of the paper where this was reported. Uh, at the end of last year, um, we, we had the chance to talk to the world about some work that we've been uh, supporting at, at Harvard University. I mean, this was uh, led by the group of, of Misha Lukin at, <clears throat> at Harvard University uh, with support from Quera, both from from uh, some of our scientists and also some of the hardware that we that we've been building to you know to integrate into the the device that that was that was created there and you know that I have very fond memories of from from my PhD uh, and this. The, this result was to show that, you know, using a, a new architecture for quantum computing, using neutral atoms, you can do very powerful things with uh, a large number of them to collect them into, into logical qubits and do, you know, start a new era, I would say, of quantum computing. We're, we're moving into running algorithms on logical qubits and this this progress has been incredibly fast uh some uh, we'll go into more details of, of of what was what was done in 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 this demonstration uh but you know different types of error correction uh error detection uh error mitigation and really showing that you can start doing very complex things with not just physical but logical qubits and and it's really creating a new a new inflection point in quantum computing, where the kind of discussion we can have is is at a at a much more higher level of abstraction, and this is something that at Quera we're we're building on. Um, this is shaping our roadmap. Uh, I guess we're we're very excited about the announcement at the end of the year of, of this work led by Harvard, but we're also super excited about the the, the plans that we've laid out for the future of, of the technology that, that we're building here at Quera and, and how this will allow users to start playing, uh, you know, this year with with these concepts and, and interfacing with devices with logical qubits at a, at a rapidly growing pace, uh, you know, targeting 
uh, or 100 logical qubits by by 2026. So there, there's a lot there, wow. and I think That's that we'll, we'll break it down. It's a perfect teaser. It literally covers everything I'm going to ask you. So <laughs> now we get to drill down into all of it. That's great. Um, so in case the concept's new to some folks, uh, can you give a little detail around what a logical qubit is? I mean, I'd be shocked if someone who listens to a few episodes hasn't heard the term, uh, but maybe you could cover what a logical qubit really means and why it's so important to the future of quantum computing. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, there's something that that I think we all understand, and that is that quantum computers will have a, you know, a tremendous computational power for, for, uh, for, for several types of applications. But we're looking at this from the point of view of what will a, an abstract quantum computer be able to do. But to get to these, to these powerful quantum computers, we need to go from where we are today with you know, tens, hundreds, maybe a thousand qubits that introduce errors at a, at a constant rate every time they do even the most basic operations to really having millions of, of, of qubits and, and, and much, much better performance that we have right now. And it turns out that, you know, you can think about making every single component orders of magnitude better to get to that point, which is a daunting engineering task, I must admit. Or you can take a different path. And this is this is really building on our understanding of, of error correction for classical computers and, and, and for classical communications, where there's a, sim- a very simple core idea, which is that by taking many bits, or in our case with quantum computers, qubits of information, you can redundantly encode a smaller number of, of, of qubits in them so that as the computation happens, if there are any mistakes that are introduced, that you can catch those errors and you can pinpoint where they happened and correct them. So the, the classical example that that is, you know, I think it's it's where we all start is if if I wanted to to share a a bit of information with you, right? Like it, it's either a, a yes or a no. And the yes is a zero and the no is a one. And I try to send it to you. If there's some noise in the channel, you know, you, you might see my zero every once in a while flipped into a one or my one flip into a zero. <clears throat> That's not super useful for you if, if, it, if it takes away confidence from, from what you're seeing that I'm sending you. So what we can do is I can send you three of the same in a row, right? And and then you can do some majority voting. If you see more zeros than ones, then you have a very high confidence that the message that I was trying to pass on to you was, was a zero. Uh, and you could even then find any, any areas where you thought there was an error and flip them and then continue using that to pass on a more complex message to someone else. And that is what we do with, with logical qubits. We take uh, a... a, a a larger number of physical qubits to encode one or, or or more logical qubits. And we're able to interrogate them throughout a computation, catch if there are errors and correct them. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a really clear, clear explanation. And and the catch there is what the ratio is and, and depending on the technology and everything. And we'll get to that. Um, so there's a lot of nuance to achieving logical qubits, right? Part of it is how good the initial qubit is, I believe. Mm-hmm. And then there's then that whole idea of like pooling them together to do the work. So can you give us a little bit about what's behind the blank scale curtain here, if you will? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there, there's uh, the ratio that you're shooting for, which I think I know what it is, uh, and, and how the error correction kind of like works. Yeah. So uh, again, kind of going back to this this idea of of redundantly encoding, in principle, the the more you know, the more physical qubits that you use to encode the logical qubit, the more confidence you have that you will be able to. 
find and correct the errors faster than they can affect the the computation. So that that ratio, that overhead, is is very important. Um, just to harken back to the the beginning of the conversation with the you know the results from from last year, uh, one of the things that was very cool about this demonstration is that it showed that with different different ways of encoding the logical qubit into uh, the physical qubits, um, you can see the, the the performance of of different quantum error correction codes and different what we call code distances within the same uh, uh, quantum error correction code. One of the one of the results that that you know you can see if you go to Nature and pull up this 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 paper is that for I would say that the war what has been the workhorse of of the quantum error correction uh, work that has been done in the last several decades the the surface code when when you implement this with with you know, with with in the way that it was done uh, in this work, you can see that having a larger overhead actually leads to better performance, and this is because again, the the more physical qubits you have, the the better your ability to find those those errors that you know are ideally occurring at a low rate, and 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 you know. Uh, suppressing them, so this this is really the 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 key enabling feature of of error correction that you can, in principle, exponentially suppress the effective error by going to higher encoding. Of course, this is something that depends uh, also on the on the fidelity of the physical operations mm-hmm. and. For the results from late last year, um, they were really enabled by the fact that you know up to up to last year the the entangling operations between two physical qubits using neutral atoms, which is the platform that we have been developing for many years, uh, the best reported numbers were you know in the ballpark of like ninety seven, ninety eight, close to ninety nine percent fidelity, but. To, to be able to do efficient error correction, you really need to suppress that, that error or increase the fidelity to the point where you actually have a chance to catch and correct errors faster than they, than they appear. So there was a, a, a new way of performing these physical entangling operations that took the fidelity to above 99. In fact, uh, there was a, a result of 99.5, and that's really what enabled um, the the error correction work to happen. Now, this is there's there's a few reasons for why uh, this is the case, and I actually want to point out that the pace at which we saw going from the breakthrough in, in having high fidelity operations to demonstrating operations with logical qubits was really just a few months. And this this speaks to the fact that the architecture that has been developed on the neutral atom platform is incredibly flexible and very powerful. And this is done by leveraging the fact that the it is relatively easy to put more physical qubits together. So you can start with hundreds of them. And it is also relatively easy to control them and to control them with high fidelity, regardless of which, you know, which pair of qubits you're working with. So that makes it uh, so that any little improvement in, in both the number of qubits, but also in the fidelity in the operations very quickly translates throughout the entire system. So this is this is what what gave the the this platform the ability to show, you know, uh, working with logical qubits as possible, exploring many different types of uh, quantum error correction codes as possible, and that there is a path to improving uh, logical operation fidelity <clears throat> by increasing the code distance and of course also by increasing the the physical operation fidelity. Now because Neutral atoms are a pretty clean qubit that we can model very well and we understand. Uh, 
we we actually see where the dominant sources of of imperfections are for that you know remaining half a percent or so and that's something that can be improved through better engineering so one of the things that we're working on at at Quera is <clears throat> in translating these developments from uh, from the academic world into products that that will bring to to customers uh, first by matching the technical capabilities and then by you know bringing to to end users and to help them also understand what the, what kinds of approaches to error correction there are. As I said, there's not just a single uh, way to do quantum error correction. There are many different codes. Uh, the overheads is something that users will be able to, to play around with. And we actually see a lot of opportunity with some of the some of the newer ideas for how to implement quantum error correction code with, you know, uh, low density parity codes or QLDPC codes that have uh, that have gathered a lot of attention in the last year or eighteen months. Uh, this is something that we have already started exploring how to implement on the neutral atom platform, and that we're very excited to see other users. Uh, be able to to work with soon could you um could you explain code distance it might not be something that yeah. people have heard yeah yeah so uh, code distance is again the you know if if i want to send you a zero mm -hmm. i could send it in as a single bit or qubit or i can send you three copies of the same thing or i could send you five copies or seven copies and you can always do some kind of, uh, you know, majority voting. And so okay. it's basically, it's basically what is the, how many, how many errors do you need to introduce in the physical, uh, uh, in the physical qubits before you would misidentify what the logical qubit en uh, encoded was. Okay. So you can see what that's the overhead. Yeah. That's an important number to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. <clears throat> um, so can we talk about what device was used in the, the Harvard project? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I got to come and see Aquila in person. Uh, that was really cool. Uh, I love that. Um, and then when you weren't looking, I made a few modifications and that's why you guys, <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> but, but you know, that was a really cool tour. Um, so can, can we talk about what was used in that project? Um, and if it's going to be available on the cloud or if it's just set completely on the side? that part yeah so so i think that for it's important to clarify you know the aquila was built <clears throat> with you know kind of inspired by a system that that was first built at harvard university mm -hmm. this was actually the work of, of my phd and others uh throughout the last several years uh aquila took all of you know all of the learnings and 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 know how that that uh, many of us developed uh, by working at the university and translated it to a product that is now available on the cloud for for everyone to access. That same system that that was built at Harvard and that resides there that has gotten modified over the years, <clears throat> and that is what was used to to actually run the the results that that you can find on on the uh, on the nature paper um which th we'll that link. system yeah sorry yeah. we'll link that uh in the show notes of course so people can find the, right. uh, the paper yeah great um yeah so so that system is is still at harvard is something that is you know used for research purposes here at Quera, we're building new systems. So Aquila will continue to be available on the cloud. We're <clears throat> we're not gonna you know we're not gonna take it offline to make changes, uh, but we are building new systems to translate those advances that that have been happening at the university, and also to integrate some more of the of the um, controls and and other systems that we have been developing here at the at the company. These are the systems that we're going to use to to make available to customers to bring them these new capabilities of digital operation with with neutral atoms and in an architecture that is able to support uh, quantum error correction. Okay, so yeah, so the second generation that you're working on to make available to customers is going to be 
more than the 256 qubits in Aquila, and it's going to contain from your roadmap 10 logical qubits that customers will be able to access this year? That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, we're starting with, with 10. Uh, there is still a lot that... <clears throat> um, a lot of work that that we're we're starting to lay the foundation for for customers to be able to uh, you know build their favorite logical qubits, start running algorithms on them. One of the things that we're targeting for this year is to provide uh, software, a logical qubit simulator, to help users along their journey to understand the. Um, you know the advantages of the neutral atom platform. How the ability to move atoms and to move blocks of atoms, for example, can can simplify a lot of the 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 computations by parallelizing many of the operations, uh, and to help them develop their their own applications. You know, in preparation for the hardware becoming available to them to run those directly on the hardware. Um, this is something that we're going to do later this year, and as you say, we're we're going to be going for uh, up to ten logical qubits. One of the things that we're we're looking at is uh, users will have the ability to run you know NISC type applications with you know in just a the, the traditional digital uh, quantum computing operation that they might have been accessing already uh, or, you know, over the last few years. So we want to see users be able to apply the same kinds of algorithms that they've already developed for the NIST era and then start translating some of those to, to uh, running algorithms on logical qubits so that they can themselves see what the you know how how performance uh, changes as they move from physical to logical qubits, and to continue developing these applications with us over the next few years as we go from ten to thirty to a hundred logical qubits. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. So if you think about it, anytime you do an emulator of qubits, it's a logical qubit sort of because there's no noise yeah, yeah, introducing, exactly. right? <laughs> so, but you're creating a simulator to show how to simulate the steps to get you to the logical qubit too, right? Like you start with this exactly. many qubits. Yeah, because otherwise, you know, what, what's anyone going to learn? Yeah. No, that's that's exactly right. And we, we want users to have also an understanding of what the physical errors translate to in, in the types of, of algorithms that they're going to be running. Yeah, that's an exciting approach. So um, you said it, 10, 30, 100. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through these quick steps. So then the third generation, which would be next year, uh, that would be the 30 qubits based on, let's say, roughly 3,000 physical, mm -hmm. so that's about 100 to 1. Um, and uh, what kind of applications do you see running on that uh, in, in what you call prototype applications there in your timeline? Yeah, I think that here at, at 30 logical qubits, as you say, I mean, you, you can build a, a classical emulator right where you say what are mm -hmm. what what do i do with 30 perfect qubits <clears throat> and the reality is that 30 perfect qubits uh, i could run it i could run that on on a computer i can yep. run an emulation of that so what we're what we're looking for is for people to start porting over and developing their applications to be efficient on the logical qubit operation because Quantum error correction is an incredibly powerful tool that, as as we were saying, it it allows you to improve constantly the performance of the device so that it truly becomes scalable. But it comes at the cost of a more complex operation internally because mm -hmm. there there is this concept of constantly checking for for errors and correcting for them. So at 30 logical qubits, what we're what we're expecting to see is uh, kind of the, the applications that's that were developed and tested with 10 logic uh, with 10 logical qubits to then be increased and see how the performance uh, uh, evolves with an ever increasing number of logical qubits. At this point, again, for if you if you just take a classical computer, you'll be able to predict exactly what you should get out, and that is great because 
it gives it will give people confidence that what they are getting out is exactly what they should be getting out because today what what we have with quantum computers is a very powerful tool that is hard to 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 predict right so when we in this nisc era i think that one of the things that we've seen is there's a lot of optimization to be done where you get a result out and you have to then make an assessment of is this good or not? Did the quantum computer do the right thing or not? Um, uh, but using logical qubits, I think that it will be a lot easier to say, yes, the computer did what it had to do. And just like with classical computers, you know, you, end, you, you write your code and you have confidence that the classical computer is going to do the right thing. And that's what we're, we're evolving towards with quantum computers. So, at 30 logical qubits, we we expect to see a lot of the early applications that people have been ideating for the last for the last several years, translating to uh, logical qubits, seeing that this is uh, you know performing correctly, and then porting it over to in the fourth generation, the larger number of qubits, the hundred logical qubits, where you can you can just no longer have a classical yeah. computer predict exactly what the quantum computer will do, right? So it's it's this it's this journey and the the yeah. the path of having constant confirmation that that the device is doing the right thing, so that when you can no longer predict the behavior by classical emulation, you still have confidence that it is doing the right thing, and that it is doing something that is unique that is not achievable with any other device in the world. Yeah, that's a great point. So fourth generation, the point, the question I was going to ask next is <laughs> once you pass 50 logical qubits, give or take, you're in uncharted territory. You know, yeah. we, we just can't get that to run. Really. And that's exciting. <laughs> that's beyond exciting. So that means 2026, we'll have access for the first time, if all goes well, to a number of qubits that represent truly uncharted territory. Stuff that if we even tried to simulate it with the best tensor networks for example once you try to contract them you're still going to run into troubles um yeah. so, so this is going to be an amazing time so that's where the first gate-based advantage might start appearing right that's the general idea yeah and of course i mean all some of these things will be you know gradual changes right uh, we continue to increase the number of physical qubits that does mean that you know users will have that that choice to make, especially in, in this early stage of the of the you know, quantum error correction era, where they can choose to use more physical qubits without the you know the the performance guarantees at the end where they can say, you know, mm -hmm. with confidence this implementation of the algorithm didn't incur an error, but where they can still develop more complex algorithms where they can see what is the average performance. And then it, it, the, the decision will be either that or start working with, the, with, with logical qubits where you reduce the number of available qubits, but you gain confidence in, in what the device is outputting. So I think it's, it's going to be a lot of uh, kind of going back and forth and developing in applications on one that may not, uh, you know, may not port over until a year or two later, but where the know-how that that users are generating is still very valuable because they have direct line of sight to when they will be able to run this on on the on the logical qubit processors. Yeah, that that's a really good point. Will there be some kind of? I mean, this is really simplifying what might be coming in the future, but would there be some kind of slider where you could say, I want to go to maybe, I don't know, like 500 qubits from the 3000 and get this like half logical effect or something. Will there be like a slider like that? Well, or, I mean, that's, that's not? something that, that's something that I would love to see how, how end users want to engage with these, uh, mm -hmm. with these capabilities, right? At the end of the day, yeah, you can, I mean, in the early days, you can do error detection without doing error correction. And mm -hmm. there the encoding might be 
might be lower. So this this trade off is, or, or you can or you can just try to suppress the error so much by having a large overhead that you're left with even fewer logical qubits, but you have that much higher confidence in in the results that are that are coming out. So there's no one path to to quantum error correction. I actually think that we're just, I mean, this is kind of like at the beginning of the day, the sun is rising, right? And and we're just starting to get a little bit of visibility. But I think that in the next few in the next few years, what we're gonna see is a lot of code development of hardware, of quantum error correction codes, of uh, algorithms, and you know, using the right combination of algorithm, quantum error correction code, and hardware will allow us to extract more early value from the devices. It might be that for some algorithms, you know, for algorithm A, uh, a particular quantum error correction code is, is, is more applicable because of the types of operations that are simple to do in, in that particular code. Whereas for algorithm B, you know, a different error correction code will be, uh, will be more powerful. Of course, we're, we're working towards a future where no one needs to think about this right and and eventually you know you just have you just you just know how many logical qubits you have and and the everything else is is happening in the background and and it all works great but there's a lot of 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 learning and development to be done in the next few years and honestly i think that there's going to be a lot of input from uh from end users about what the right applications are from uh, new ideas coming out of the out of the industry, but also out of uh, academic research, and you know, supporting this you know, this uh, commercial, academic, and even uh, government ecosystem is going to be what what makes quantum computing advance at at an ever increasing pace. And I've got to tell you, it, it's. Almost heartwarming, which is a nerdy thing to say, but heartwarming to see <laughs> a, a timeline or a roadmap that has both logical and physical on the same like bar. It's kind of cool. Um, and, and if I extrapolate out, it's fair to say that you'll be cracking encryption by 2030. So thanks for that. Um, we, we, a lot of people are now going to um, panic. <laughs> I didn't say that. Yeah, um, I know. I know. I'm just I kidding. Mean, but if you had to guess, there's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah. yeah. If you had to guess, where would you see a thousand logical qubits coming in? I'm actually super optimistic. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that I think that we'll see a thousand logical qubits before 2030. And you know, it's it's really hard to the conversation we're having today. I think that it would have been hard a year ago for like any, any of the people think that you had on your podcast how many of them would have told you that we would be having this discussion today right where yeah no one. logical qubits or or you know we're talking about commercial devices with 100 logical qubits within just the next few years i think that progress is actually accelerating and i think that we're going to be at a thousand logical qubits before 2030 uh, I think that there's a lot of, I mean, there's there's the the pure brute force approach that we actually know can take us there, but there's so much more room for for improvements and for for acceleration from coming from new quantum error correction codes, from new clever ideas that are, you know, developed side by side with the hardware to have fewer physical qubits required for a particular number of logical qubits and where the operations are happening in a much more efficient way. And I think that is actually what happened last year, right? Like it, it was a it was a step change for us in the architecture and how we build and operate uh, the, the neutral atom quantum computers that allowed for all of this to happen so quickly. And there's many more of these very clever ideas around the corner. So there's a there's a brute force path that can get us there, and everything else on top just accelerates the the path to get us there. I'm I'm really excited. Um, I, I felt it brewing. I knew that this was going to be a big year <laughs> coming, 
And uh, yeah, thanks for not letting me down. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So uh, for everyone listening, uh, you can definitely check out the links in the show notes. Like I said, there's going to be the paper. Um, You can go see the roadmap for yourself. And as uh, Alex said, you can actually check out Aquila now. So, uh, you know, so you can just see where, where it is today and, and, and what's coming in the future. So thank you so much for, for being a repeat guest. And I'll have you on again when you break another uh, threshold barrier with uh, your machines. <laughs> happy to be here and happy to come back anytime. This has been great. Now it's time for Coherence, the quantum executive summary, where I take a moment to highlight some of the business impacts we discussed today in case things got too nerdy at times. Let's recap. QRA has a production-neutral Atom quantum computer, Aquila, which has been available in the cloud for a while now. This machine was initially developed based on PhD work by Alex Kiesling and others at Harvard. The neutral Atom system, still at Harvard, was used to create an astonishing 48 logical qubits recently, much to the industry's surprise. QRA is working to implement these techniques in future generations of neutral Atom systems that end users can access. Before this year ends, you can use up to 10 logical qubits. There are several ways to accomplish logical qubits, but you usually need some combination of minimizing noise and using consensus to agree on what results are valid. Let's simplify the concept with an example. If I told you I can suppress errors enough to be 99% certain a zero or one I transmit will be correct, and I then send you five copies of say, a one, you can look at the results and agree that Most of them coming through as a one means your answer is one. An occasional zero can be ignored by consensus. Quantum emulators or simulators don't have any errors unless you introduce a noise profile to match specific NISC systems. So in the past, emulating qubits on a classical machine meant you could use up to 50 or so perfect qubits depending on hardware. But that's been roughly the barrier. Every simulated qubit doubles required system resources. So if a supercomputer can do 50-ish qubits, you'd need two supercomputers in perfect tandem to add just one more qubit. Because of this barrier, things will get even more interesting as we approach 2026. If Alex and the team are correct, we'll soar into uncharted territory with 100 logical qubits. As a result, Quantum Advantage will likely appear in many types of gate-based use cases. It's time to give QRA systems a try to be ready to shift real-world use cases to the platform. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Alex Kiesling for joining to discuss QRA. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Pertivity's The Post-Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on all socials at Constant Hacker That's constant with a K, hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services at Pertivity. You can also DM me questions or suggestions for what you'd like to hear on the show. I hope to gather those and maybe do an AMA episode soon. For more information on our quantum services, check out Pertivity.com or follow Pertivity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious.